If it wasn't for the screenwriters, we wouldn't have a screenwriter's coffee talk, or an actor's coffee talk, or a director's coffee talk, or a composer's coffee talk. So let's uh, give it up for the writers. Um, <laughs> and we'll do this from right to left. Uh, his first uh, movie that he wrote and directed was a small movie called Sword Swallows and Thin Men, and then he got his, uh, his first produced screenplay was a small movie called Godzilla. <laughs> uh, please welcome Max Borenstein. Yeah. Uh, in the middle, a good friend of Film Independent. Uh, always love to have her here and hear her great words of wisdom. Uh, she was Oscar nominated for Erin Brockovich, uh, wrote the screenplay to Yes, In Her Shoes. Uh, she's also the creator of A Gifted Man. Please welcome Susanna Grant. <laughs> and our hero who saves the day, moderating today. Uh, he's, you know him from such great uh, classic, I'd say now, movies such as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, <laughs> I still say beef oven. I s um, Men in Black and uh, last year's hit, Now You See Me. Please welcome our moderator, Ed Solomon. <laughs> and it's over to you, Ed. So thank you. I'm sorry Craig is homesick. Or, or homesick. He's homesick. He misses his mommy. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't. He cried. He was crying. He's just curled up outside. So, uh, so anyway, we're going to... I mean this. The point here is to really address what's on your mind, and we're, we can talk for a little bit, but before we did, I was curious, just to get a sense of the room, uh, how many people in here are writers or would like to be writers? Okay, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna sort of point randomly to little sections and ask a question and just answer it. Uh, the question will be, what I'm hoping to hear about a little bit today is, how about you? Uh, process. process. How about you? Character. Character. You. Story, Story and inspiration. inspiration. You. Handling studio notes. You. Protecting, Protecting yourself. And Breaking the mold. Breaking the mold. Attacking, Attacking your rewrite. Ooh. Over there, anyone? Development. Development. You'll shout it all out. Finding a producer. Finding a producer. Dialogue. Dialogue. How to get to 100. <laughs> 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 yeah. Do what I'm you doing like now. Yeah, get other people to do the work for you. From 80 or from 180? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to get to 120 for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like those road signs that you pass going, wait, we were supposed to pull off there. <laughs> Holy shit, now there's no U turn for 25 miles. Um, yes. Going from being a writer to a writer producer. All right, you know what? Why don't we just <laughs> let's just start? Okay, <laughs> uh, let's start with inspiration since that's sort of the, the beginning. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you do? You believe in inspiration? I do, but I actually think, at least for me, a lot of the um, inspiration I trust the most comes from a very unconscious place in myself, and. I don't actually like to look at it that hard I th because I think if I look at it too hard, I'll get very conscious about it and ruin something. So I, r I just follow something if it's interesting to me. If something is interesting to me and I want to read about it some more or play with it some more, that's it. That's all I need to know. And often I'll look back and say, oh, God, that's so obvious why that was interesting to me at the time. But I have a tremendous amount of faith in my unconscious instinct. I think it's actually a much better writer than my conscious instinct. So um, really, it's just gut, very gut inspiration to me. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I have a process that I go through to help foster those unconscious moments of inspiration so that that's what research is for me. Like if, I'm if I know, if I have some general sense of what I'm gonna write or if it's an assignment from the outside or whatever it may be, then I, I have certain techniques or I'm gonna get a bunch of books and read them and then I'm gonna get, I'm gonna start, you know, just, I have different ways that I'll research and the point of that is that as I'm doing it, ideas will start to pop up and without, without me having to force it, uh, they'll come, you know, and I think it's part of the, f the terror is like where you're gonna get ideas. I think the only thing you can do, because it's always unconscious, at least from my perspective, 
is try to develop some strategies of like, oh, well, you know, if I go through these, you know, five different strategies, then something is going to come up. I'm going to have some inspiration. What strategies do you use? Well, I'll, you know, if there's, uh, if I know what genre the movie is that I want to do, uh, and maybe there are books or other films, or if it's a, you know, if it has anything to do historically, then I'll always re I have like stacks of books that relating to every project and I'll just sit down and spend a day s skim reading and then finding bits that are interesting and taking a bunch of notes and filling up a yellow pad and then I'll go and, and I'm like without worrying too much what it's gonna become. But as th I find that at some point I can't do that anymore because I'm like, I have cri critical mass mm -hmm. and that's when I can right. begin refining it, you know? What about inspiration when you're in the middle of a project? I need to make this scene work. I can't figure out a way into this. I don't understand what this, ca oh, this character's not working. How do I fix it? F for me, and this isn't so much strategy as looking back and saying, where, where was I when I solved those things? And often it's when I'm exercising. I think there's just mm -hmm. something in what happens when your body temperature changes a little, your body chemistry changes a little, just something, things shake up um, I only write mind. while having sex. <laughs> for, instance. for that reason. So I write <laughs> once every two months. <laughs> and I get a lot done in those <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so y you got to get a lot. That's, that's how I get uh, 120 pages after about 10 years. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> the other thing I would say is <laughs> to look away from it. I get, I, yeah. I've noticed these are incredibly mundane, not nearly as entertaining as writing while having sex, but <laughs> I, uh, I have a lot of good ideas in the supermarket. It's really dull, but I think it's because I'm looking away and I'm doing something that doesn't require any concentration That might all. be what exercising is, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a glance away, and l it's probably just the same thing, letting your unconscious take over, which is hard to do when you're in front of a computer and you're supposed to be productive, you know? Yeah, it's helpful in a way to to have a routine of I'm going to exercise at X time every day, I find too, because otherwise I would probably, if I was in a difficult moment on a script, I'd never leave. I'd just spend the entire day tearing my hair out, but being forced to go away, right. invariably something happens. I got very freed when I read a quote by Philip Pullman. He wrote The Gold, the gold Compass. Because um, I used to believe that I had to be inspired to, like, to write, like, and he said, he didn't. He he was basically talking about how he thinks inspiration as a uh, as a beacon to strive toward is uh, is bullshit. Mm -hmm. He said my job as a professional writer is to write great stuff, whether I'm inspired or not. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my god, he's right. <laughs> it's like, oh thank God. Like, cause first of all, I never feel like I know. There are so many different ways in to the story or into the scene or into the character or into the idea. Um, I never feel like I know that ahead of time, what's going to lead me into it. And the image I have is, um, oh God, it's another sex image, and I'm so sorry about this, but it's like <laughs> the sperm, you know, like all the different sperms hitting the egg. Like you don't know which is the one that's going to go boom, and then, you know. Um, <laughs> you, you better just stick with this for the whole talk. <laughs> that's going to be the whole talk. you found your theme. There's someone who's going to drive Craig Mazin over here <laughs> from his deathbed. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> you've got to go in when there's a SWAT team with a helicopter <laughs> <laughs> yanking them out. <laughs> um, I never know exactly what it is that's going to be the thing that opens it up, you know? And I actually believe, like you were talking about the unconscious, and I actually believe so much in both the power of the unconscious to help solve problems and also uh, the power of subtlety. Like you said how, you know, like I, n I kind of trust my gut in a way. That's a subtle thing. Right. A con conscious thought, I find never works for me. Conscious thought like um, what this needs is a whatever on page. Uh, you know what always works? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, or an inciting <laughs> incident or, a, or a whatever the words are that you hear all the time that you feel like you have to achieve. You know, these weird, these uh, slalom posts that you feel you need to get around. Those to me are, are lies, and they, they actually uh, don't open the door usually. Um, what often opens the door for me is like, I believe in this, uh, like subtle is significant. I, I once had a, a teacher tell me that. And I believe that, like, 
um, like, oh, this feels right. Let me, let, me, let me go through that door for a minute. Let me explore that. Let, and, and only by knocking and knocking and knocking and then, oh, that's the way into that. Mm -hmm. And gosh, I mean, I, I, uh, so many things are different now that I've been doing this for a long time. And I'd be curious to ask, like, now you've been doing professional writing for 10 years. Yeah, I've been writing professionally for 10 years, and, I've, and I started writing screenplays when I was 13 or 14, so another 10 years or <laughs> something like that. And, I, uh, uh, and, and I, I, along those lines, a lot has changed. Like when I talk about different strategies, they're not answers, they're just ways of facilitating the kind of thing you're talking about, which helps me not be anxious about the fact that I, something's gonna come. Because I think the thing is that you can, you, like if you, if you th the weird thing about writing professionally is that you're taking something that is in some ways or in many ways ethereal and r r you know, relies on serendipity seemingly or at least unconscious and so they're not bottleable and you're saying, oh I have to do it by you know, June 27th and that's it. And that can be overwhelming especially at first and, I th and for me I've, I've found that having, the more I've done it, the more I know that, well, if I know what I can, how I can distract my mind from being, feeling that pressure, and then I, and that'll help just sort of unconsciously open doors. But I think that's something that does come with time. Uh, and I'm definitely on the way, but not there. <laughs> what did you, well you said protecting yourself, right? Breaking the mold, and you said protecting yourself. So what did you mean by protecting yourself? Meaning, uh, so could you hear that? <laughs> what he was saying is I found that copywriting and registering things doesn't actually protect you. How do you keep yourself protected? Um, I have a theory about that. You probably won't like this. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit about being yeah. protected. I agree. I so don't care. First of all, I, I, I remember I, I was taking a fiction writing class. And in this class, we the, uh, one of the exercises we did was the teacher had, uh, and she did it three different times over the class. She would read at, at the speed it takes to read um, from some source material. Once it was a poem, once it was a magazine article, and once it was a, a, a book, a novel. And our job, the exercise was write as fast as you can using only words you hear from coming out of my mouth. The only words you can make up are conjunctive words like and or but or you know, therefore, right? 11 people in the class. She would read for 10 minutes. We would write as fast as we could. And then we'd stop, pens down, everyone reads their stories. 11 people. Not only were the stories entirely different, you couldn't tell they were from the same source material. My fervent belief is, even if somebody steals your idea, it's gonna be so different. First of all, people don't steal it as much as you think they do. I mean, maybe you, you're nodding saying you've had that experience, but I don't find in my, I've been doing this for my whole life as an adult, I haven't found that to be the case. Or if someone's lifted an idea, by the time the idea becomes what it is, it's so different than what I would have done with it. it does, and, and ideas are just everywhere, I feel like. Now, if someone actually takes, if someone actually li steals something from you, I mean, there are, you've got documents in your computer and there are all sorts of, I'm sure, legal recourse. Um, we don't copyright screenplays anyway, as you know. Um, but uh, what the Writers Guild registration does for you is it just puts a sort of hard copy somewhere and, and gives a date to it. Um, I used to worry more when I started out about it. Like, I used to be, but now I actually feel like, I don't know, you know, idea. Uh, I now feel like if you're going to do this job, one idea, one you scene, cannot, that's the you thing. You cannot be attached to that. You can't hang everything on one idea, and uh, you have to have tremendous faith in the infinite uh, you, universe well, of ideas. It's a marathon and like if, this and whole if you thing. And if somebody yeah. is an asshole and steals something, that sucks. And if there's nothing you can do about it, that sucks, but move on. If because there is something you can do about it, do it. If there isn't, uh, I mean... Well, if, if all you have is the one... The one right. idea that's your precious idea, then it's then that's a tragedy and it sucks. But 
But also, no, but I, and I say it not in jest, but if you want, if what you're aiming for is like, I, and that some people just have the one thing that they desperately want to tell, and that's a different story. Right. But if you want to be, you know, a working professional writer who's going to have a body of work, then, then that means that by definition, there's a body of work, and you're talking about the pinky, you know, and that's right. great. It was a good pinky, a, and they probably didn't steal it anyway. Maybe they did in most cases, you know. Look, that said, there are definitely cases definitely. where movies, you know, where people have sued and they were right, and they they were, you know, rewarded generously, and, and you know, people do do bad things. So I would say, if your work has been stolen, pursue it as much as you can. But don't let that don't let that stop you from pursuing everything else that is a better use of your energy. Most of the time, people get worried that a script that they've written on spec will cross the transom of someone's desk, and then someone will read it and take it, and then tr mm. redo it. Uh, truthfully, I I've not seen that happen for several reasons. First of all, it would cost them so much more in legal fees mm. to battle that than it would be to option it, and especially if you're a new writer. They'd option it for almost nothing. You know, point being, it's way, n and not only that, they're looking desperate. This is a big lie. I mean, this is a, people m really don't get this, which is, the, the, the problem with breaking in has much less to do with networking and contacts and having the right agent or the right producer than it, than it does with getting your material up to a level where it's really as good as you think it is. And yeah. you don't have a way to know. It's very hard to tell. Me, most of my scripts are not as good as I want them to be for a long time. And the difference between me as a writer now who's been doing this thir more than 30 years, Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> and when I was new is I, I don't, it's not like I turn out better stuff right away than I did on my first scripts. I just have a better sense of when it's ready. When I, A, h when I'm not done, and you need to keep pushing it, and sometimes it's a lot longer, and I'll bet you if we took an average of how long it takes everyone to write a script here, I'll bet I'm longer than all of you. And with all my experience, I guess, you know? Um, so, wait, where was I going? Oh, so <laughs> the difference is, I, I, I both know when I need to step away from it, and when I need to, you know, push on it. I, I, when I, when I um, first started, I was doing stand-up comedy. I was like, a teen, you know, in my college. And I was up on a stage at the Comedy and Magic Club, and Jay Leno was on the stage, uh, was also on the bill. And I went into him at the Green Room. I was 19 years old. And I was like, Mr. Leno, um, I have a joke. Can I read it to you? And will you tell me if it's funny? And he goes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna s I can't do impressions, so I'm not going to try. But he goes, I'm going to stop you right there. He goes, do me a favor. He says, Go on stage a thousand times, and if you still after that need to ask me if the joke is funny, I will answer it for you. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what an asshole. <laughs> but what it was was like the wisest advice yeah, I had no heard. There's no shortcut. Yeah, there's no shortcut. Yeah. There's no shortcut, and if you're gonna have a career in this, what you realize, and what big difference between now and then is, I go, one line, one idea, one scene, even one whole script, believe it or not, I will work for years on the script, and it goes nowhere. They reject, you know, I get fired, or they don't buy it, or they buy it, or they, and change it, or they, whatever, or it doesn't get made. You know what? It's part of the whole lifelong commitment to this long river of, you know, writing. Yeah. I didn't mean to, you were going to say something? Or just save me? <laughs> 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 I think at one point I was going to say, you were talking about uh, the difference between, I mean, th the fact that there's actually very little difference between writing after 30 years of it and, and when you're starting. My first drafts are as bad now as my first drafts, you know, 23 years ago. They are as raw, as obvious, and, um, yeah. and it is. It's just keeping at it and saying not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. That's the important voice. And if you are more rigorous of on yourself than anyone else, then you might get you might get work. You have to be harder on yourself and not believe your mother. Don't believe your mother. <laughs> um, really, be harder. I'm I am so hard on myself, and I think that's what's made it you know made me do fairly well. I, b I genuinely believe that you know that chemical that is produced when you have a baby. I 
I'm going to guess that I can't answer that. You mean that. After, the, after the sperm finds the egg? After the sperm finds the egg. <laughs> and then a bunch of stuff happens I don't know anything about. No, but uh, when you have a baby, you have this chemical that like says, oh, my baby is adorable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is like, yeah. it's a oxytocin. Yeah, okay. I actually believe, genuinely believe, when we finish a script, the chemicals that we emit inside of our own bodies <laughs> is not dissimilar to oxytocin, where you feel so good about having completed it that you can't actually make the judgments that you want to make about it because it feels so fucking good to have a script done. It, it never feels, feels that good again. <laughs> every <laughs> moment, every subsequent yeah. moment after that is So yeah. you need to seek out the people who are going to say, dude, that is an ugly baby. <laughs> really ugly baby. You yeah. need to have them in your life and hold them close. Yeah. And it's... And, it's, it's and I still love you. Yeah. And that's the thing. They well, that's be a loving. That gets into a whole thing, which is, especially when you first start out, the idea that every judgment, uh, like, yeah. that people that are judging your work or judging you, you, or the fact that you chose to do this, or the fact that you had the... That you're oh, God, it's really, it's really hard to, you know... You plus time... Meaning, you finish it, you have a bunch of time, and then you reread it. You pl and, and, and the shortcut for time, I always find, is other people. Yeah. And they read it, and they start to talk to you. And that gets into something someone said, how do you deal with notes? We should talk about that, both studio notes as well as notes from friends. Like, what are successful strategies for hearing notes? I mean, I think, you know, one thing is to take for granted that most people giving you the notes want the movie to be good. They have other, they're, pol they're always other, other factors going into a note you may get from a studio that have to do with realities of production or politics and different things, but those are real things. And at the base level, everyone's work wants that, everyone involved in the project is probably gonna have their name involved in the project and wants that movie to be really good. And so I think taking note personally, while it's natural, is a really, you know, dangerous, sort of way to go about it. And you have, you know, I think for me, you can, you read the notes. I have, a, what I do is I read the notes, I print them out, then I avoid them for like a couple days <laughs> and like I see them there and I'm not looking at them. And then I'll eventually I'll sit down and I'll read the notes and I will make m like margin notes that are my internal monologue, like ugh, <laughs> or <laughs> really? <laughs> or come on, you idiot, or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and then, once I have that out of my system, I'll like read it back and already, even just allowing myself a moment to process it like emotionally, I will find that by the end, oftentimes the most difficult thing is to not take them all literally and to have a little bit of discretion and say and know where, you know, where they're suggesting something because they believe uh, because there is an issue, but maybe what they're suggesting is the wrong way to go about it. And my job as a writer is to say, I see what they're getting at now, but that's the wrong way, and I, I have to find another way. So not avoiding the note completely, but learning how to you know, roll with that punch and see what the actual issue at hand is. But I think you know, ultimately the issue becomes not just, just letting it feed right through to your fingertips and uh, thoughtlessly. There are two different kinds of notes. I mean, I, sub I, I guess it depends on the kind of project. You, when you are, are a writer for hire and they have brought you in and this is the book or this is the material, um, then there's studio notes and you're all sort of have your eye on a, collec a collective vision of what this is going to be. Ideally, you all kind of see it the same way. That's different than something you're doing on spec for yourself. Um, but I think in both cases, it's important to say out loud or write somewhere uh, what the intentions are, what the goal of the piece is, uh, tonally, thematically, plot-wise, so that you know, uh, you can forget that when you get into page 80 and you've got all these plates, you know, spinning. Um, but to be very conscious going in, and that can change, you can change it, but to be really clear, either with yourself or with your partners, about what everyone sees and, and you know, if something, if you feel yourselves veering far off of that, you can say, wait, remember we all agreed. I also never leave a room if there's a note I don't agree with. I don't, I don't just walk out. I'll, I'll have that conversation you have in the room and mm -hmm. say, well, and often it's a note 
you know, if the note's wrong, it's like you said, there's always a problem someone's identifying, and I will ask somebody to open the script and say, show me where you first started feeling this. And, and, and usually that can get someone away from what feels like a bad note and more toward identifying uh, a problem in the script. And, and then you can go solve it your own well way. Well, those bad notes are like symptoms rather right, than the underlying right. disease, whatever if that exactly. may be. Exactly. I find that if you get out of your head the idea that there's such thing as a bad note. Right. Or something that doesn't make sense to you, I guess I mean. Yeah, it's like going to the doctor. You go to the doctor and say, my stomach hurts. The doctor doesn't go, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know? He goes, well, it could be gas. It could be you've got an ulcer. Or it could be you're anxious. And then you're right. There isn't a medical problem there. It's just that you're, you know, right. I... I find so often writers screw themselves to no end by being so defensive, mm -hmm. And you screw yourself in so many different ways because, I mean, and I find that there is a, a big similarity with getting notes from your friends, when you're, which is what you're doing when you're first starting out, or getting notes from studio executives, mm -hmm. which is you have to get your own ego out of the way. And you have to be willing to accept the fact that despite what you wanted your script to be, it's not appearing that way to others. It doesn't mean they're correct about why it doesn't work. And in fact, one of the problems I find with giving m my script to other writers is I don't find their notes to be as helpful because they're often projections of what they would do. And some, sometimes they're amazing writers. And it screws me up because then I start going, oh, what they would do, and then I'm outside of it. What I find to be the best strategy for me is to listen and just sort of track all that horror feelings you feel in your body when people are saying negative things and not react. Like you were saying, just sort of let it, let it go, you know. And um, I agree with Susanna. I don't leave the room not agreeing with notes, but I never disagree, disagree with a note in a room. Never. Never. And I, I mean, I have a whole rubric as to why I think it's a stupid idea, uh, which I could go into if try and do it quickly, which is this. First of all, and step in if you like. Professionally, it's stupid. Let's just start with that. You're in a room with people, most of whom are smart. One of the other misconceptions is that you're in a room of idiots. It's never the case. Mo you know, people don't get to their positions without being at least smart. Some people are, you know, aren't all that smart, and they f but they ultimately fail away. But you're in a room with professionals who want to be perceived as a colleague and who are colleagues. You're in a room either with um, people who are a boss or an employee of someone else. If you reject their note in the room, the first thing you do is you create a, an emotional and a kind of a personal experience between you and that person. And it becomes, it becomes very embarrassing for them. But it's worse for you. It's worse for you, let's forget about the professional thing. Let's say it's actually a quote bad note, L meaning, you don't agree with it. Uh, what Susanna is alluding to, I think, is exactly right. If you just do it skillfully, 95% of the time, the quote bad note falls away of its own accord. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that? Yeah. You just open it up. Exactly what she said. Where were you starting to feel this problem? And I'll often actually start it with, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Exactly. You Absolutely. know, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, just walk me through this. All the time. Help me out with this, or right. open that up some more, or, or tell me that again, or. And it's not bullshit. It's it's you're not just uh, you know playing dumb. I mean, the truth is there is a there is a gulf of understanding between you. Um, and they have a problem, and regardless, you know, regardless of what you'd like it to be, they have a problem with it. You need to hear it. It may not. The solution is often not right. That comes, and especially in, in any room, the solution that comes up in a room. I find is often not Especially right. even when it's yours. Because yeah, oftentimes when it's yours, I find I'm trying, there's the initial desire to take that path of least resist resistance, to find yeah. like the easiest way out of, oh, well, what if I just did that? Okay. But I think that's most dangerous because then you, what you're really, that's just a strategy of ignoring what may very well be a real problem. It's all because all we're trying to do is solve our own anxiety. <laughs> because we work oh my with God, our I'm brains. gonna have to fix this somehow. Yeah, and yeah, and when exactly. we when we don't know an answer, we get anxious, and so we want to have answers really fast, and that you know. But w so so like if you open it up, most of the time somebody goes, actually, you know what? That's not my problem. My problem is this, and then you go, oh, this is the problem. The problem isn't here on page 86. It's here on page 23, where this stuff happens. It's not set up so that right. So more often than not, if you just keep engaging, right, 
But the other thing that happens is, let's say you don't come to, the, to an agreement in the room. So you go away. One of two things happen when you go away. One is you still can't solve the problem. Or you still disagree. What you do then is, when you've given it time, and I don't mean fake time, but real time, and you've really thought about it. I mean, again, please tell me if you guys disagree or whatever, but you, you can call or go yeah. back in the yeah. room and say, always call. it's always best to do that yes, anyway, absolutely. I think. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, we, were, we were talking earlier, I think, I, all three of us, the, the, the notion that studio executives and, and producers are, or, are, or development people are, are not that smart and just giving notes to justify their jobs is, no, I think, categorical nonsense. Everyone's trying to make a good movie. And the more you see them as partners and the more you see meetings not as note-giving sessions but as collaborative working sessions, the better off everyone will be. Gratitude and compassion. I am so grateful to be in the room with you. Thank you for taking the time, even if we disagree. Thank you for being willing to hire me. <laughs> Thank you for listening and reading and thinking, even if we don't agree. Oh my God, it cuts through so much of that stuff I sp in the first half of my career where I was arrogant and defensive and thought it would all last forever and like, Jesus, you realize when you've had a few rocky years that you go like, oh my God, I'm so lucky. The by the way, the other thing that happens when you go away, because you can come back, you can come back and once you've actually thought about it, you can come back and go, you know what, these 19 things like I did this, that worked great, thank you for that, that really helped this, da da da, I still can't get my head around that almost always they go, thank oh, you for, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. thank you for trying, you know, we appreciate your, they want, people want to be heard, that's all, they want to be heard, respected. By the way, the other thing that happens, and this happens more, than, is you go away, and you're thinking about it, and you're going, God, that note is horrible, oh, I hate that, I hate that person, they're an idiot, blah, and then you go, oh, shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And it makes it so much better. <laughs> I always find with those with those little yeah. margin notes I make, the one that has the most exclamation points and the most uh, yeah. four letter words <laughs> is the, that I resist the longest is always the one that at the end I'm like reluctantly, wow, that was genius. That's the <laughs> that's the one. And yeah. you know, to be honest, that's often the one that instinctively you know it's just going to be a lot of exactly. a lot of fucking work. It's your own, <laughs> it's your own you inner writer. You thought you were done. You yeah. made a really good draft. You thought you were done. You know. Yeah. But, but the truth is, as soon as you accept that you're not really ever done, no. and I think the more you do it, my experience has been the more you realize that you're not. Yeah. Like there, I, I don't. Maybe that exists. I hear tells of like Eastwood, you know, directs a script or something word for word. Like that happens. But even then, it's not done. There's editing and whatever. But in my experience, it's always a process. And the moment you accept that, it means that, yes, you can enjoy the oxytocin at the end, mm -hmm. but you know intellectually that it's really just somewhere in the middle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then once it's over, then it's just the frustration of looking back and wishing you had done something differently. So <laughs> it's better to be in the process. Which is why I never look. I genuinely don't look back. I don't watch. I mean, I, I sometimes will see the movie because... We go to a screening or whatever, but I don't. Yeah, it's like playing. <laughs> I always find that interesting, like when you're coming down the aisle from the restroom and there's like someone watching, and yeah. you're like, "Well, you can't walk out at least." <laughs> <laughs> I was I was flying and and I was sitting next to somebody, and he had a choice of movies. Oh no! And my uh, the one I had written and directed was on, and I was like, "Dude, don't! It's not for you. It's really, it's not for you." <laughs> And then he picked it, and I was like, just <laughs> make it to the end. <laughs> just <laughs> I, I actually willed myself to sleep. Not, not to know. Just pop in Ambien. Does anyone uh, want to? Let's take some of the. Yes, sir. Oh, great question. The question for those of you who might not be able to hear is, how do you use the screenwriting books, like the Sid Field books or other books, when you're writing? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on Ed's bandwagon here and say, for me, um, it's a lot like sex. Craft is really important. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry I almost spat on you and I'm sorry I've been talking about sex and you just pointed out a sorry young to girl you. to me I apologize Hold. as well close your ears it's a lot um, craft is very important having 
things in the right place is essential. But when it's really good, it's not because of craft. You know, I mean, so. Can someone write that down for me? <laughs> 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 to add it to your. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so it is. It is. Im <laughs> it's Im it's important. I mean, that's what those books are giving you. They're giving you ways of um, building a skeleton, mm -hmm. and and potential model skeletons that might work. And on that, then you need to put real flesh. I think one of the, I, I think there's wisdom in all of them in some form, probably. And I think that the, like the cliche is like, oh, one doesn't need it or whatever. And maybe that's true, but I think to the point that Ed's been making a lot of put away your arrogance and try to sort of open yourself up, that's, w to, to that end, I think w it behooves one to kind of look at them as potentially useful and maybe not. But to see those books as being, you know, all the things that people write them off as being all the time, like, you know, oh, that's just a paint by numbers thing or whatever that. And, and I, you know, from my own experience, for a year, you know, was sort of self taught and self trained and wrote them off in my way arrogant, more arrogant younger years uh, and never looked at them. And then I remember one time when I was just vaguely curious and I, and that, the Robert McKee book, I got it but I took the dust jacket off because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> and I went out, iPad. Yeah, and I went out to the beach <laughs> like, and read it, and it still had the dust jacket off just in case someone ran by. <laughs> and, uh, and I will say that in reading it, I felt like you know, half of it was stuff that I had kind of come to on my own, but was some of it was fairly well articulated, and I thought, well, that wouldn't have been useful to me had I read it early on as some kind of rule, but it was interesting to me now because I came to that, you know, knowledge by hard work, and uh, and so it meant something to me. And then another half, uh, or like you know maybe another twenty five percent, I thought was very insightful and interesting. And then there was twenty five percent I thought was not interesting. But I think you know just opening yourself at the moment I opened myself up to the idea that there was something to learn which, believe it or not, like I didn't have for years, because I think that's very natural when you're starting out, that I think I got a lot better. I think it's about your relationship to the books, you know, and your relationship to your process, and do the books help you? You know, I, 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 m I m imagine that Kobe Bryant goes back and does certain drills, you know, I, and I, I didn't read, I didn't read those books early on because I wasn't a film major and I didn't have access to them. I have found it helpful at times to sort of peek into them and go, because they reaffirm certain things, mm -hmm. like, oh, it's good if your story moves fairly quickly if it's supposed to move quickly, or mm -hmm. it's good that, you know, I always find that things could probably happen sooner and, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. But uh, the problem always to me is that people read them and then think that the way to write a script is to hit these marks, you know? And it's like, building a body, you know, a human body, of course, it needs fingers and arms and legs and toes and organs, but if you just go collect a bunch of them and put them together, you have, you know, an inanimate object, and uh, the books tend to be about, right, the books that I found helpful, I, I, re I remember reading uh, Anne Lamott's book, Bird by Bird, and I was like, wow, that was a really good book about writing. That really f opened me up. I found it really moving and emotional. Um, you know, sometimes I've actually come to the point where I actually like if somebody says to me, I feel like that has to happen by page 40 and it's happening on page 60. And I go, yeah, that makes sense. Because what, what I'm really hearing is they're already well into the story when something, f it feels slow to them. But, but like trying to, m trying to force your brain around hitting a something on page 10 and then something else on page 20 and then having a rising this and a descending that and like that's, that's just not the way it happens. I mean, you can look at, if they wrote, imagine if they wrote books about symphonies. If all the different screenwriting books, if there was as many about how to write a symphony, how many good symphonies would really be written off, off of that, you know? It's about what you hear. It's about what you feel. I think the brain, we misunderstand, the brain is the enemy so much of our writing process. We get clever, we get left brain. Uh, to, for me to get into a good writing space, I have to be in, in, in an emotional space. 
like a feeling space. And then the idea is attached to the feeling, you know? Like character, someone was asking about character. Let's, let's talk about character. How do you come up, how do you, like you, you've written some great characters. How do you? This is probably the area I'm, I'm least uh, helpful on because it is the thing that comes sort of naturally. It's a thing I did when I was three. I just made people up. Um, but when I look at a character and I think, eh, not that great, um, how do I expand them? I mean, you know, always think of the shadow of that character, you know, that everything you know about that character, they contain the absolute opposite of it within them as, as well. And that's always, that's always a good thing to sort of jog you out of something that's pat. Um, but it, 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 character is honest, char well, dialogue too, it just, it, it, it's kind of intuitive if I like this person, if I'm interested and a little bit mesmerized and a little bit curious, um, then I will want to write, if I can't write them or if I'm writing them badly, there's something wrong with the character. Is character dialogue or what yeah, is character? Uh, I think it's I action, I don't, don't you think it's, I mean, I feel like, Often I think dialogue can give you a window into character, yeah. but to my understanding of it, it's all about, that's more characterization and that's more you know what they wear and things like that, which may be insightful about their character. But a lot of, I think oftentimes, it's very easy to do that where you mistake the things that are characterization for being character. And like, oh, this, well, who is this guy? Oh, well, he's the guy who wears a really sharp suit all the time and talks really fast. But that doesn't really tell you anything about how they're going to act, which is the only really important or the more important thing. Uh, and so I think w a useful question I try to ask, because it's very easy to fall into that trap, is to, si is to really try to, I try to think of people in my life or people, I, I, people I've read about or people I, m better, people that I actually know or and and then maybe find elements of myself, but that you know, there's just a more visceral understanding of people that I've met or interacted with, and if I can find a piece of that person, uh, even just as like a you know initial handhold, uh, I find it helpful, and then I can kind of build around that more eccent eccentricities and you know idiosyncratic. So. How do you hold the whole story in your head? I often don't until the end, you know? I often, uh, that was actually, I remember feeling a little panicky when I was starting because you'd have this thing and you couldn't, I couldn't hold it all in my head and that would make me nervous. Um, but I don't worry about that anymore. I think it's, uh, you know. Uh, Do you outline? That's uh, what I was going to ask. I outline yeah. and then I, the outline evolves. Uh, the outline rarely, it's, it's always close to it. It's sort of like I, I usually, it was like a road trip from Chicago to New York. I know where I'm starting and know where I'm ending, but I mm -hmm. usually end up taking a very different route. Um, I don't think I've ever written a script where I didn't end up in New York, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> metaphorically. Um, <laughs> I, I find that, I, I, and everyone, I, I'm, that's a question I'm really curious about for you two, Ed, the outlining thing, because I always find that uh, in a way, every writer outlines, even if they don't call it an outline. Because I know writers who insist that they don't outline. They go, no, I do a little thinking, and then I dive right in, and I write a really, really rough draft that's really bad, and, uh, and yeah, I just don't think about it at all, but I try to get to the end of it. And then I just refine that. And I'm, so basically, you outline. That's an outline <laughs> with a lot of words. But you, yeah, must have outlined, you must have outlined Now You See Me. That's yeah, and we're outlining the sequel like intensively yeah. right now. I use. Uh, by the way, I think the other thing is every script has a different yeah. uh, you uh, you outline differently on each script. I outline different amounts on each script. We'll get you next, okay? Um, and uh, it's like you know, it's like ch many of you are parents, I assume. When you have kids, certain you know, I have two two kids, um, and each of them has a whole different. I, I teach them differently. I, I discipline them differently. Because of what, you know, each, each is very different and each script, uh, every script is different and I think one of the mistakes I used to make more and I still make now but is thinking that the one process that applied to that script mm -hmm. needs to apply to this one or the process that applied to the beginning of that script applies to the middle of the script. 
and again, it's about the relation. It's about the dance that you're doing between yourself and your process and the material and stuff. So, for something like now you see me or you know, the one, it's super complex. And so I'm trying to get a whole thing up. I have a um, whiteboard yeah. on all every wall of my office, and if I could, you know, paint the whiteboard paint on everything, I would do that. And you know, um, uh, and anyone who wants to <laughs> see the board. Uh, it's on my so you're getting really high all the time while working. Yeah, <laughs> from yeah, the from, yeah. <laughs> of course. Do a lot of drugs. That's what you want to do. <laughs> it's really the best thing. Um, no, uh, yeah, no. From um, I'm always I'm, I I try to because it's really important to me. What I was going to say is, if you want to see it, I have it on my phone. I always uh, take a photo of my mm. boards so that I can have it in my computer. So if I'm working in a coffee shop, I have access to my boards. But I find that. For me, I have to go into the into the macro, you know, out to the macro, and then into the micro, and out to the, you know, const it's a constant in and out. And and to me, the what I've gotten better at over the years is negotiating that process for myself, mm -hmm. like knowing in, out, in, out. Be critical now. Go in and don't be critical. Let yourself kind of keep create now. Pull out, look, assess, go back in. Because there are different places, different parts of the brain, and different activities even, you know? I like to talk about it sometimes. I like to put people in the room and have to discuss it with them. Mm -hmm. um, I like uh, writing it up on a board while I'm standing up and being kind of kinetically involved in it helps me. But then also I need to get inside and type and write and use my fingers and handwrite. And, and I, I get different parts of the process in each, pro you know? So so yeah, I have a huge outline on my board and, and squiggles and writings and scenes are written on the, because as I'm outlining sometimes di dialogue and, di you know, and then I have another board on the other side of the room, which I will then do the next draft of an outline. And then by the time I'm writing, I, I sometimes don't even look at them, yeah. you know? Um, there's a, it's, it's a, again, another misperception, I think, th that the, like you said about outline, I think that's really smart, that you're, you're it's just a, everything, every draft, every outline, it's just a snapshot of, of, of something that's moving and alive. You know, it's just a, a draft is a, is a 3D photograph of something that as it's, you know, and if, as, long, as long as you, we make these goals for ourselves, I gotta get to 120 pages. And once I have that and it's complete and I type fade out, it's done or it's, uh, you know, it's just part of it, you know, it's just, it's all, yeah. Uh, you had a question. So the question was, I'm an actress. I've just written a feature film. You're a little old to be doing that. <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> do I need a mentor? Well, you know, it, we all do. Yes. And Mentors are wonderful. And, but they can come in all kinds of relationships. You know, there are a couple of people who I met briefly and said one really important thing to me that resonated for me in that moment, I consider that person one of my great mentors. Um, I don't think she considers me one of her great mentees, <laughs> but the moment was really resonant and important to me. So there are mentors all around you all the time. Listen and um, be open to them, and I guarantee you they will present themselves. Also, um, you'll, I mean, it's amazing that you've written a script. I. I couldn't even imagine having done that. Um, is it a script for you to act in? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you're an ambitious little one, aren't you? <laughs> Unless you're actually like 40, but just. <laughs> <That> strange disease. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that reverse of the aging one. Yeah. Um, but yes, you know, ha having people read it, having them give you criticism. It's, it's how old are you? 11. 11. Okay. I had written 20 when I was, by the time I was six. Um, uh, you know, keep the best thing you can do, I mean, the fact that you've done that is amazing. The best thing you can do if you're writing and writing for yourself is read books. I wish I had read more books. If someone had said to me when I was 11, 
If I, if I could go back to myself when I was 11, I would tell myself, read more books, and don't worry about writing stuff that's bad. When you're older, you're going to get really worried because you're going to know that what you're writing isn't very good and it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you close up and stop because you're going to be really critical of it. Now, when you're 11, I don't think you really have that. But when you're in your 20s, it's really easy to get frozen by... You, you love reading. Well, then you're off to a great start. Yeah. How do you use how do you use escalations to build your conflict, and how do you use a city as a character? Well, I'll talk about <laughs> the second one a little because I did a movie that was I set in L.A. and L.A. was a very big part of it, um, and it was really knowing that 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 character was in every scene, and what's that character doing in every scene, you know, um, and treating it as if it has as much to contribute to that scene, both in terms of conflict and conflict resolution, as any other character. If you keep that in your mind, that, that helps a lot. Um, I don't, I, well, I, what was the first Someone else answer the first one. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know exactly the phrase, like the phrasing you used, I'm not, but, I, but maybe to speak to it, I think conflict is, it's, the, it's one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that makes a scene a scene. And it's really easy not to have any in a lot of places. You don't want to force it, I think, just to create conflict for conflict's sake. But part of when there's no conflict, the story's over. Uh, or then the scene is over. And I think one thing that's useful in... I, th I think I can't speak to the initial writing process. Like the way Susan was saying, it's more inspiration. But it's all. whenever I think about writing, it's really thinking about what I'm doing when I'm looking at something I've sketched out or written and how I make it better. So it's really about rewriting. And when rewriting something, I, the first question I try to ask, which I don't often, is it, it turns out that what's missing is that we're into the scene too late because nothing, too early because there is no conflict yet. Or we're out of it too late because the conflict's been resolved already. Uh, and then there's something new that's going to become. And there's always something. And if, there's n if you don't think there's any conflict in a scene, it's because you're not thinking clearly enough about who those characters are. And again, like not about the just surface level, but who, they, who a character is, I think, has a lot to do with what it is that they want uh, and, in, and what they're willing to do to get it. I find I go, I'm always going back to a couple things, like what does this person want? Like, I like I'll get, you get all wrapped up in all this cleverness, t which to me is the enemy of truth, cleverness. Yeah. It's like, ugh, it's easy to get clever, and it takes no courage to get clever. You know, and, I, and, and so I'm always going, wait, who, what, what does this person want? Or what's the truth? What would they really do here? Mm -hmm. And sometimes dialogue can mess up your character in a huge way because you get wedded to this beautifully witty Great exchange. That, Great that to me, that to me is the big reason why I don't, why I, I've found now that I love to outline before ever committing a, a, a dot piece of dialogue to paper. Because the moment I do, it becomes something I care about and want to fight for. And yeah. so I try to resist writing dialogue as long as I possibly can, so that I don't fall in love. Right. And it can, it can you know, uh, five beautifully written pages can mask problems really, really well. Because yeah. you go, wow, yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah, that's, that's really smart. I mean, that absolutely. Because you can do that. You can create a great exchange that lasts five pages. And then you can find yourself trying to wrangle and mangle, like, an entire sequence yes. around it, you know, or the whole, you know, and once you realize that dialogue, like to me dialogue, because does, dialogue does come early for me, and I write it down, or I'll record it if I have the foresight to do that. But I'll, I'll try and get it down, but I won't get attached to it. And I will go, um, I, I, will, I will try to keep as many things in RAM, I guess I'd call it, you know, like in sort of temporary space, as long as possible. It's like keep putting stuff in temporary space Temper and and no try to know that I can pick and choose from it and pull some stuff out and it can always change and I'll often look back at dialogue that I thought was so great when I'm further down the process like oh do I and I'll look at it and go what of this you can always go back but I'll go what of this do I actually want to keep now that I'm actually writing and usually it's a little bit of something but usually what dialogue does is it tells me more about what the character could be mm -hmm. as opposed to 
Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like someone I heard use the metaphor. It's like, you know, you, you design a window shades and you love them, but you don't try to design your building around window shades, you know? Right. Yeah. But in terms of escalation, it's that what does a character want? But then the next question is, what's, what's the obstacle to achieving it? And the bigger an obstacle you put <coughs> in front of that person, the more it demands of the character and the, the more conflict there is. And, uh, you know, you don't have to resolve you don't have to resolve those conflicts within scenes. You know, leaving leaving before things are resolved is a good way to escalate. Those are little things. Everyone has their own personal problems, right, that they bring into their work that are their that are the problems of their writing, I think. Did I cut you off, by the way? I didn't, what? I didn't mean to. You stayed for me. Oh, okay. okay. Because <laughs> what I was doing was I was going, other people, other people, other people, <laughs> other people. Silence, <laughs> jump in. <laughs> so I just didn't know if there was silence and I just, or I just heard it, yeah. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, no, go. <laughs> no, go. <laughs> my own personal problem is I is is sometimes like I find my characters don't always go far enough. I tend to have them repeat. They're kind of repeating their issue, and what you're like, they gotta get through the scene or sequence, and be, and like go into the next one, which they couldn't have done had they had that one, and then they go into the next one, and th and sometimes I find that where I thought my character should go. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I feel safer keeping my yeah. character the same, mm -hmm. just like I feel safer being myself in environments that I'm comfortable with, and it's hard to get your characters like into scary places because it creates anxiety. One yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I'm done. <laughs> One thing that I find is that oftentimes when I'm stuck on a particular issue that's how do and the question can be framed as like, okay, how do I get them from point A to point C and I'm looking for a B? often the answer isn't to be, it's they don't belong in point C. <laughs> like I'm trying to push them there because I think that's what has to happen. And then the moment I, right. I allow myself to not, to just throw that away and say, well, where do they really want to go? And uh, it ends up being, that's the freeing moment, which is just not, because I think there's that thing of wanting your, like the saying of wanting your characters to sort of be what's familiar to you as opposed to reveal themselves in some way that's not familiar, but that maybe is the, the answer. But that's the going back and forth thing of going, oh wait, this now opens itself up. Yeah. So what does this tell me that this is trying to be now? Oh, that means if this character is going in this direction, what is that, then you pull back to the whole macro thing and go, well, what does that mean then about all this? And then you have to be able to judge, is this new direction better? Or is the old direction better? Is like, how do you know that the thing is evolving and that what it's evolving to is better than what you thought it was trying to be? That's I, you know. I have a question for you guys. When do you ever, uh, uh, in the middle of a process, have a revel like a moment of revelation like that that starts to, if let's say you're writing it for someone that you've told them what you're going to be doing, whether it was a work for hire, or kind of rewrite or a, or a original, whatever it may be. Do you feel the obligation at that point, if it's significant enough, or at what point does it rise to the level of, I now have to let everybody else in on this, or do you feel more comfortable keeping it in your own universe, doing that, doing what the script needs, and then having the conversation of, look, we thought it was going to New York, but really it went to Atlanta. If it's for people, as soon as I'm sure that the new direction is the way to go, I call them. Yeah. Because nobody wants to get something that's not what they thought they were getting. If you just call them up and say, I tried it, this other thing came up, I'll tell you a little bit about it, you, you know, trust you just, just trust me, trust you, there's a lot, you have to, you have to be trusting of them and, and ask them to be trusting of you. So we'll, we'll try to, let's take some more questions and then we'll try to answer it in shorter ways because there's a lot of questions. We'll, I can yeah. stay for a while, but you can, so you, then new, then you, and then we'll move around the room. Uh, by the way, I don't always take forever to do this, <laughs> by the way. How do you let go of perfectionism is the question. How do you know when something is good enough? Well, I, I think perfectionism only gets bad when it starts to be destructive to yourself, when you get mad at yourself because it's not good enough. I mean, that's, that's what I think of as perfectionism. I think perfectionism is, perfectionism is very different than having incredibly high standards. Mm -hmm. um, that's so really right. if your perfectionism is it's not good enough, I suck, I hate myself, 
I don't want to do this anymore, that's not good. If it's just, you know what, I think it can be better. I think it can, it can be better. If you think it can be better, it can be better. If a lot of people are telling you right. that it's not working yet, then that's telling you something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s I hate to say this, but sometimes it's good to put something aside for a while, start something else, and then come back to it, you know? That uh, said, it's a big threshold. There is that you, you inevitably at some point, you're going to give this thing to somebody else and you're going to be in a different phase of it. You're not going to be protected the way you are when you're working by yourself. And you just have to do whatever work you need to do to understand that you're making that transition. You're, you're dropping your kid at kindergarten. You're doing, you know, whatever it is where you realize you're more vulnerable and, and you know, protect yourself whatever way you need to. Um, so don't avoid doing that out of that fear of uh, rejection and or whatever. Um, get your ego out of it. It's also not a binary. So you have, you, it's not once it's out, it's out. You have friends and, and someone you trust. And once that reaches that threshold that five people you trust say this is good and you think they're not bullshitting you, then, yeah, anyone? The question is, is it harder for people to write original material when studios seem to be doing what I will call pre-sold titles? I mean, that's, that's certainly how it feels um, on the studio level to me. I mean, it's, it's studios are in a, a different game than they were when I started. Um, that said, there are a lot of smaller companies that seem to be doing a lot of original work. Um, so I think it's a different level, uh, you know, the, the, their smaller budgets, uh, you know, the, the $40 million original at a studio doesn't really exist anymore, but the $8 million or $5 million original with uh, outside financing does. And the so original you shoot yourself right, on your $300 camera right. with your friends and can actually manage to get up on, uh, you know, there are actual ways to exhibit those now, you know. Uh, did I, I, I think I did cut you off again this no. time. No. Oh. <laughs> get, well I think, get, get out, okay, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> get out of your mind the idea, by the way, that your first thing has to be something that you sell, because what a studio executive or producer or people who are in a position to hire people are not looking for, hey, you did an adaptation of The Hunger Games that's really awesome. What they're looking for is you have a, a voice, you have confidence in your writing, you have an, a voice that is yours, and wow, it's there's something. I moved when I read this. It made me laugh if it's a comedy, or it was scared me if it's a scary thing, you know. But it it worked, you know. It, it felt that's what they're looking for. So we all start writing our own stories. We all did. Nobody starts writing, you know, uh, the fault in our stars or whatever, you know. Oh, well, I, I promised them, and then do we have to stop? Is that what you're raising your hand for? No. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you had one, and then, yeah, it was you, and then we got so many. We should just have people shout them out. Yeah, when we, when we start boring you, yeah. shout out another question. Do any of us have the Do TV? I did a series a couple years ago that ran for a year, and then I have one that is going to start in September. Um, both at networks. After the first one, I said I wasn't going to do another one at a network, mm -hmm. and then uh, I don't know if the circumstances. I beg your pardon. No, I did. I, a Gifted Man was on CBS for a year, and then um, and then I have one starting at ABC, and then I have something that I'm doing at HBO too. So. All the networks seem to be saying, oh, we want to be in that mm -hmm. business. We want to be in that, you know, doing the kind of work they're doing on cable. We'll see if they actually do. It's, it's an amazing time to be a writer. It, really is. it actually yeah. is. It's an amazing time. I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. It seemed like it was all going to hell. It seemed like they're only making these certain types of movies. But the truth is, it's, it was just transitioning, and we didn't realize it. 
is transitioning to a place where your characters can be ambiguous, where your, where your lead doesn't have to be lovable at all times. Movies are going in a certain direction, for sure, the studio movies. But there are so many avenues opening up now as a writer where writers actually are the dominant voice. Yeah. Television, which is, look, I'm going to guess, and I'm not being a genius by saying this, but in 10 years, uh, it'll be hard to tell what it's, uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be movies that are cinema-going experiences, but then for the most part, what are movies and what are TV is going to be all the same. It's going to be series that last five episodes, you know, how's that not a movie? How's it, how is not this not a filmed novel? Like, w it there are so many ways to go. The key, I would say, if, I, if you took one thing away from me, it would be don't worry so much about what is selling or what will get you an agent, but worry about developing a voice and confidence in your writing because ultimately that is the only horse you're going to be able to ride on. Oh, yes. Is it easier or harder to write fiction versus a true story? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm curious. What are you going to say? I think fiction's <laughs> harder. Um, just because when you are going from a true story or existing material, somebody says, here, here, start the game, and here, here's a little, here are some blocks to start with. And you are, uh, you have to, you have to play with those. You know, that's, that gives you, it just gets you a little bit further into the, into the game. But ultimately, it's, it ends up, the, the last three quarters of it feels similar, but it starts you off, you know, a little bit easier, I think. I think it's a lot easier in the beginning. The, the anything where you have um, materials, existing materials that are already there and you don't have to come up with them. I find there, you know, any true story has so many facts that you don't, you're not restricted by them. You take, take what you want to take, choose what you want to decide why you're telling that story and then pick the pieces that are relevant, but they're there, you know? Um, I just, but I'm sh I think it's a very personal thing. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, that's, an I think it's, uh, maybe, it, do you think that goes for all adaptation, not only true story, that if there's something that you're adapting by, like, ha you ha that you have a similar amount of material depending on what that thing is? Or you think the truth of it makes it? I don't know, and then now as I say it, I, I completely disagree with myself, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's all the same to yeah. me. To me, an adaptation is the same as an original. Exactly. A true story is the same as a fictional story. It's like, basically, it's the pool of ideas that you're pulling from, which include what exists already, what you're adapting from, and what you've already thought of. And you, if you can have that same relationship with your own ideas, which is hard to do because they came out of you, so you tend to feel that they're somehow more emotionally attached to them. But if you can keep putting them all in the pool gra and then start to see what is the right idea, what's the right way to go. Uh, it, to me, it's all the same. There are so many different ways and infinite ways into any story. If it moves you, if a true story moves you, then that's the way in. If an original idea moves you, you know, ultimately they have to just be good. That's the one, that's the only thing. Yes, in the back. Tips for writing when you're not doing it full time. Try to find a way you can do it as much as possible, yeah. honestly, I think. Give up other stuff, you know? Um, I mean, if you're working full time, a friend of mine's dad was Robert B. Parker, and he wrote his first few books um, when he was a school teacher. And my friend would describe waking up in the morning and seeing his dad writing, and going, bed to, going to bed at night seeing his dad writing. He had two kids, a wife, and a job, and he, he and he did it. He just got up when he was tired and stayed up past when he wanted to go to bed and did it, you know, and, and probably didn't do a lot of other things. The, the truth is, it, for me, and I do this, obviously, I do this is what I do every day. If I aren't, it's sometimes hard for me to, I, I cannot just kind of go in for a few hours and come out and then go in for a few hours five days later and then come out there's a momentum that starts to build. So you have to, f 
And even when it's your only job, you have to fight for your writing time. Fight for it. Because there is, I mean, really fight for it. It takes discipline. You have to be aggressive about it. I'm not mean to other people, but I mean aggressive with yourself. Even when it's your only job. Even when you have all the accolades of real professionals want to see what you're doing. There are so many things that get in the way of you being able to do it. So having that mindset, no, it's normal. That's the normal thing. You have to figure out how you can at least get, even if it's just an hour, which means you're not going to, like, I don't get really going until an hour usually. You know, usually I need, for me, I need a cycle. I need a, um, I need a three hour or four hour cycle and a break and then a three or four hour cycle. And that's pretty much all I, I, I have time for in a day or can do. But you've got to figure out what your own rhythm is and figure out a way to honor that. Sometimes it's forcing yourself to wake up. Look, habits take a few weeks to form, but you can form them. <laughs> um, it's hard when you're not being paid for it or when, you're when, when you feel like you're on a Sisyphusian battle trying to get this thing up a hill. It is hard. You've got to find a way that it gives you joy, that it gives you a sense of satisfaction so that there's some positive feedback loop happening for you. Because otherwise, if it's all about getting somebody else to say it's good, honestly, that doesn't work when you're doing it as for a living. I, yeah. I think the only, the, it's about, uh, that's the number one key, which is that if you have to, if you're not loving it, then there's, then there's, it's problematic. Because for me, or at uh, least getting satisfaction. Yeah, getting some satisfaction. You don't have to love what, but the, the process can be painful. But if you're not deriving some very, very deep joy from the process of it, then you're in for a world of hurt because everything else is worse. Like dealing with, <laughs> with outside stuff sucks, even if, it, even if when you get good at it. So I find that if I have a day where I had, where I really felt good internally writing something, some scene, then if bad things happen business-wise the same day, it just washes away. Where the, the, the converse is not true. That if something, if I'm struggling with something and having a hard time writing or not finding enough time and something fantastic is happening, I'm like, yeah, just give me time yeah. to get into this, solve that, you know? And uh, when I, I, I was working for a full time when I started writing, I didn't start out making a living as this, and it was what I wanted to do more than anything when I, which you know, didn't mean I had a very interesting life, but it was just what I wanted to do, and I wanted to get back to it. It's a, I, I, but you're talking about the um, the need to. It takes a couple weeks, and it takes that. What you're doing is building your imaginary world, you know, and um, and I I all just always wanted to be in that imaginary world, you know, and create some place you want to be with people you are interested in, you know, that you want to come back to because they're as real as anyone else while you're working. And you know yourself and you know the, uh, you're the only one who knows how to make that, that work. We had some people over here we haven't, we'll go these, yeah. You mean it's already been done, you mean? How do you separate when you've seen and watched, when you've watched a lot of movies, when you're writing, how do you write originally? <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, the cultural well that we're in, you know, we're all neck deep, if not worse, and so you have to, I mean, trying to take an outside perspective is good, but I don't, oftentimes, maybe you're thinking of it as the story itself, or like the broad strokes has been done. Oh, there's been... There's been a romantic comedy where two people, you know, don't fall in love at the end. But that you can do that a million ways. So maybe it's about it's about the micro rather than the macro. It's about digging deep and saying, well, what is it about this that I love, and what can I bring to it that's that's that is different because it's me. And then may sometimes those things that seem like surface similarities can fall away. Yeah, it's the reason people will go hear the same piece of music played by two different musicians it can sound completely different so connect as much as possible personally to it Wait, did you have something uh, who, who has not yet got it? Yeah. 
Yes. I do. Uh, the question was, how do you how do you deal with the dialectic between the internal editor and the internal speedwriter? Um, to me, one of the hardest things when you're first starting out is your critical eye is a hundred times more developed than your creative uh, function or whatever that is. Meaning, you've seen a million movies, you've read a million books, you know what you like, and you know what good work is. And what happens is when you start writing, it doesn't come up to your level of your aspiration or your taste. So the voice that is critical goes, that's no good, and it shuts you down. To me, to me, I'm better now at dancing the dance between the critical and the creative, for lack of a better word. You know, now I'm going to write. Now I'm going to criticize. Oh, okay. That what does that tell me about what I need to write? You know, back and forth, and I can do that a little bit more on the fly. But that took a long time. To me, you have to be willing and trusting to write a lot of crap, and you know, go and just kind of go and then go, and then start to take what works and, and pull together. We used to, on when I worked on Gary Shandling's show, uh, uh, direct, uh, producer Alan Zoybel, who used to say, we're going to just do a vomit draft, <laughs> and then we're going to go through later and pick out the corn. <laughs> 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 that, you know, uh, that, uh, to me, the relationship grows with, like, allowing yourself. You got to allow... I think there's a time to be cr creative and a time to be critical, and, and you can't, it's like driving with a foot on the gas and a foot on the brakes. You just gotta know, you gotta let yourself floor it for a while, and then you need to pull back and look at it. And yeah, you were gonna say I I Yeah, I think you can actually build that into your s routine. What I will often do is write into the night and not look at it, but start the day rereading the day, the previous day's work, and marking it up, and crossing it out, and moving stuff around, and and then I sit down and I make all those changes, and then I've sort of ramped myself up to what it. comes next. But I don't do it. I start the day with that. Um, I don't do it as I go along. And honestly, That's every smart. single day, I'm lucky if. 40% of what, I mean, that's a lot. If 40% of what I wrote is is salvageable, I mean, sometimes it'll be 10, but it's great. I mean, if you can find a great 10% out of a day's work, that's a good day. No, that's a good day. But you um, finite bites. Uh, my mistake is I will do that too, but then I'll often start right at the beginning again. Oh yeah. And then I've got like a <laughs> super polished yeah. 30, exactly. you know, and then, uh, oh. Yeah, that last 20 pages. <laughs> yeah. The routine is such a big part of all of it. It's like yeah. figuring out what works for you and then trying to routinize it so that you so that even when you're not feeling 100% or you're n or the you're obsessed with something in t like on your conscious level, you know what you have to do because that's what you do every day and it's going to help facilitate those things. Yeah, it I'm becomes muscle memory that yeah. that's what you do every day. I'm told we're going to have to wrap up. Is there any burning desires as they <laughs> say in other meetings? I save compulsively like ev uh, different files so that every page I've written, uh, I will save a completely different file of it up to that point. Just because I find that sometimes, uh, usually I'm wrong, but I'll be like, oh, it was brilliant two days ago. And then I look back and I'm sometimes disappointed, mostly disappointed. But I, I always try to do that. I save a uh, trash file for every draft of stuff that I've written that yeah. I like and might want to put back, and it's usually twice as long as the draft. I overwrite Absolutely. tremendously, at least twice as long, and I can count on one hand the number of times I've pulled anything from that and used it. But I like knowing it's there. Yeah, me too. Same. Same. Absolutely. And I have, I have a qu oh, I don't yeah. know, we don't want to deny them, but I sta there was a question I asked earlier that I want to ask right, you now, <laughs> okay. which is that uh, <laughs> growing up in Los Angeles, uh, I always this was always a burning question, because whenever I drove through the Inland Empire, past San Dimas, 
the, o- the main thing I know about San Dimas is Bill and Ted. <laughs> so I was curious. I always assumed that you must have grown up there. So what was it that, that made San that Dimas? happen? Yeah. We, uh, by the way, I, I told these guys this before. M- one of the, my proudest things in writing ever was that I, uh, I drove by San, San Dimas and saw on the sign for San Dimas that said, 50 years and excellent adventure. <laughs> and that made me <laughs> so happy. But um, we chose it because um, we were just, Bill and Ted was a product of my friend Chris Matheson and me just working out, doing comedy in a, st- in a theater that we rented for $20 every Monday night with no audience. Me and Chris and three other guys, uh, Mark Sandrowski, Ryan Roan, a guy named Mark Jaffe, who lives in Cleveland um, now, um, would just rent this space and do improv stuff with no purpose other than to try to just work our muscles. Not to perform, not to get agents, just, to, you know. And a year or so in, just on a random Monday night, we didn't record anything ever, but on a random night in the middle of the evening, at some point, we were like, okay, let's do guys who know nothing about history studies for <laughs> history. So we're like, oh, okay. And Chris called me Ted, and I called him Bill, and then my friend Ryan was Bob, and, uh, but Bob did sort of fell away. And Chris and I, and we so loved doing those guys that we just started messing around doing the guys here and there. Then uh, initially, one of them, I can't remember which, lived in San Gabriel and one lived in San Dimas. Why that? As random as Chris going, Ted, Bill. We just went, <laughs> whatever, San Dimas. You know, we, we wanted him to be somewhere remotely, you know, non, non-glamorous right. in the... It always seemed like the perfect place that you hear about on traffic reports, <laughs> but like maybe have never been, but you know it. <laughs> you know. it yeah, and that, that, that was it. And, and I mean, don't you get this feeling too, is where you think of something randomly, like w- Portland or Denver? I don't know. Denver. Denver. <laughs> and then you said it in Denver, then suddenly you're going, wow, we're in Denver. <laughs> like they made it Denver. Wow, how weird, you know. Um, I th- any, anything, l- any, then we'll, we, I think we have to stop, unfortunately. How to find a producer with a f- $5 million or less script. I mean, Look, it, it, yeah. The <laughs> only, I know nothing about this. The only thing I do know is that if it's a good script and you can get it, uh, e- Sundance is very good at connecting scripts and producers. So if you enter the, s- uh, the Sundance screenwriting labs, they can be very helpful. That's the Truth only thing I know. But there are a million, I think, I mean, yeah, I don't have a great piece of, w- but I don't think, I think probably there is no, there's no one, there, right. uh, there are many avenues, but the common denominator is that, I- that the mat- if there's great material, everyone's looking for great material greedily and hungrily. Yeah. Uh, and, yes. and great doesn't always just mean it's quality writing, but something that would be commercial for whatever their needs are, and, but, but people are always looking for that, so you know, get into the right, as many hands, and if it, is, if it is at that level, it's bound to find its home. There, you're trying to convince other human beings to uh, be moved on some level by what you've done, and get it right? So how do you do that? And it's, unfortunately, people are very used to having thousands of other people, co- people who work in positions of, of um, stature or power, people who guard the gates, to these things happening are so used to having thousands of people approach them and they become very uh, jaded. Just statistically, most of what they get isn't very good. How do you get that past that? Like w- w- when I worked on Gary Shandling's show, I remember we were told we're not allowed to read by law spec scripts that came in. We just, for whatever reason. And I remember that I was, we were there late one night and I was making coffee in the thing and I was waiting for it to brew and there was literally from floor to ceiling piles of spec scripts that were in envelopes. And just randomly I thought, I'm gonna just take one and look. And I opened the envelope and uh, by the way, most of the stuff that you get from people was them overselling themselves, you know, um, Hope it's not cold out because I'm gonna knock your socks off. You know, like, it's <laughs> like, uh, hope your floor is carpeted or whatever. And you know, like people trying to be impressive and clever and whatnot. And I remember 
And actually, I, I was flipping through cover letters. That's what I was doing. I was flipping through cover letters, and they were all like that. And then there was one that was, dear, uh, who I, you know, I don't remember what it's like. I live in Connecticut. I, uh, I, I enjoyed the show, and I wanted to write an episode, but I don't know if I'm on the right track or not, and I don't have anyone who could. And it was like, oh, a human <laughs> being. Uh, you know. And I was like, I r and I remember reading it. And I remember thinking, well, this doesn't quite work. And I called the guy, and I said, hey, I read the script, and I don't think it works, and here's the reason. And I remember, I then I thought to myself, wow, why did I read that one? Well, I read that one because it felt like a human being had sent it to me. Toward that end, you've got to think about what you're really trying to do. And that is talk to a human being. You're trying to communicate with another human being who is overwhelmed with bad material. Statistically, the odds are, like if you came up to me with a script, which I don't have time to read, so <laughs> <laughs> but if you came up to me with a script, I'd be thinking the odds of this being any good, and, and I'd love it to be good. The, I'd love nothing more than to find someone and be able to go, oh my god, this is great, and tell my agent, you gotta represent this person. Everyone would, by the way. But, but what I'm thinking is the odds are so low that it's not worth my time trying, honestly. So how do you do that? Like, well, you try in as many different ways, but if you're getting a lot of negative feedback, you need to think that I might need to rework this or have it reworked. You may really. But some things uh, you might want to try are, there are a lot of people who guard the gates of the people who guard the gates. So f for instance, assistance. You can look at a movie that this produ a producer that you might want to get the script to. Become familiar with their body of work. Read the credits at the end. Write to the assistant. Say, dear so-and-so, I'm a fan of so-and-so's work. I've written this script. It's about, don't get into that thing of like trying to summarize it in a paragraph and like hook me on a, all that, don't. Because that just reads like an amateur stuff. But just be honest. I've written this thing or I've, you know, and I'd like to, would you be kind enough to read it or read 10 pages of it and let me know if it's, um, something you guys would be interested in. Go beyond just, you gotta be as creative on your thinking as you would be on your writing, on your strategizing about yourself. You know, people's assistance, um, but so much of it is about, are you a person that, this, that I would like to help? I don't wanna help someone who's bragging at me. I don't wanna help someone who's like super insecure. Like makes or needy. I don't want to. I want to help someone who feels like a human being who's working hard, and who deserves a break. <laughs> you know, and everyone wants to help. Yeah. That thing of asking somebody to read ten or twenty pages is actually a really good one. I I don't have time to read a script for someone, but I have on occasion read you know ten or tw twenty pages. And um, I and just you know did that. And if you yeah. if if you're into it, you'll read more. And I have often told people why I stopped at page 20, you know? And it's a freedom thing. It's yeah, I, I sent a, I, I had somebody, I don't know how they wrote to me, but somebody wrote to me, and uh, by the way, the problem is not just time to read a whole screenplay, it's brain space. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's really hard. I mean, to like fit someone else's script in your head and really give it thought. But somebody wrote to me and said, could you read 10 pages? And I, I said, what? Uh, just my curiosity alone, I was like, sure. And I read them, and I thought they were okay. Um, and I said, look, I, I don't want to read the whole script. I don't have time. But if you want, I'll send it to my agents, and they'll, they'll cover it. They're, the agency will have it. You can at least get some feedback as to whether, and I have no idea what, what happened with it, because they, but they, they read it. Um, so that was a way in, and what, what it was was a letter to me that seemed like a decent human being who was telling the truth. Could you just read some of this and tell me if I'm on the right track, <laughs> you know? Y yeah. Back to your original question, though. I think, uh, I think almost every agency now is, has their eye on the small uh, budget movie. I mean, I know my agency has a division of putting together, you know, five million and under movies for their clients so it's a it's a it's not the most profitable part of the business but it is a significant part of the business so if you do have representation definitely hit them up for their help on that i think w i'm being told we we, we need to stop and i uh, thank you very much for being here
Yeah, I want to thank you guys for staying late, for your generosity, with so much amazing advice. So thank you to all three of you, Ed, Susanna, and Max. Thank you to all the other panelists. Thank you for you guys for making the Coffee Talks another sellout this year. Go away, write great scripts, get them made, and come back here so you can be a panelist. And we'll see you elsewhere at the festival. <laughs>